I'd like to uh, introduce Father Pierce, who's coming to us from Greece. He is the translator of this book, uh, Elder Pisces of the Holy Mountain. He translated this book along with one other person into English, and I, uh, we ordered the book early so that some of us could read a little bit of it beforehand. And I'm just about done with it. I've got that much left to do. And I must tell you, this is one of the best spiritual books I've ever read. It's in the, my favorite book before this was Wounded by Love. And um, it's, it was wonderful because of the life of the elder, Elder Porphyrius, and because of his teachings. It's the book at both. This is filled with everything. This is a 700 page book. When I originally heard about the book, I thought that much of what he had, uh, Elder Paisius had done and said was translated already into English. And it seemed to me that, um, you know, what's the book? It's just going to be another rehash. This book is so comprehensive. It takes the beginning of his life from when he was, uh, practically when he was born, and uh, talks about his development. And it is so thorough in how it unfolds his life. I must tell you, I took this book on vacation with me uh, last week. And as I was reading it, I just, I'll just tell you honestly that I, I felt totally ashamed. Because there wasn't one area of life that I read about, and there's, it's comprehensive in the elder's life. His love of animals, his love of people, his sacrifices, his ascetic endeavors. He has a tremendous amount of things that he has accomplished in life through his, through his love of God. And so many people that he helped, so many people that he healed, so many people that were transformed by him, just person after person after person, miracle after miracle after miracle. I was telling Father, in the beginning of the book they say, we're not gonna really talk about his miracles, we're just gonna talk about his life. But he said, Father, everything you read about is a miracle by this man. Everything he does is a miracle. He, it, it's like whatever he touches, whatever he sacrifices, whatever uh, whatever accomplishments he makes, they're all just miraculous. But the most important thing that I want to say about the book is that he's such a good man. The reason I felt so ashamed is that he's so good. He's so sacrificial. Whenever anybody needed any help, he would get up and give it within an instant. If he ever anybody needed anything, he would give away whatever he had immediately. He wouldn't even think about it. Nothing for him was more important than helping people and loving God. Nothing. And uh, he was sick so much of his life. He, he, he practically died a thousand times from the sacrifices that he made. And yet he would, in the middle of dying, get up and help someone else if he thought they needed help. And it's so clear in the book that he's that kind of a person, and he's so wonderful. I really have never read a book about a person that was as wonderful <coughs> as this man. Even Elder Porphyrius in his life, and I love Elder Porphyrius, I would, they would really, they, they, I know they were friends, they knew each other, but I have to say that this book is at least as good as that, as Wounded by Love. So if you have a chance, we have the book in the back, if you have a chance and are able to read the book, and get the book, I highly recommend it. We ordered it for all the priests of the city before um, he, uh, Father came, and uh, we've all been beginning to read it or reading it, so that we'll all be, well, oh, look at this, Father John Townsend's here. I said, probably Father John wouldn't come, and there he is. Christ did uh, <laughs> So there's your answer. Good to see you, Father John. Good to see you. Father Alexander, good to see you as well. Um, so, um, Father has come from Greece. He is the editor of the book. He's going to talk to us about the book for about 45 minutes, and then he will take questions about the elder or about anything that you have related to Elder Paisius. Um, it's a great honor to have Father with us tonight. We're, we're joyous to have him, and without further ado, Father, if you come. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Christ is risen. Christos Sanesti. Christos was Christ. Well, it's a joy and an honor to be with you tonight to celebrate together the memory and the life of one of the greatest saints of the 20th century, 
but also of the church in its 2,000 year history. And I think that if you do end up taking the book home with you and you read it with piety, with love, you will agree with me. It is a tremendous account. We've read about and we've read the teachings of uh, Elder Paisios, many of us, that circulate in English now, at least three volumes. There'll be two more coming out in the near future. But we really have not read about the man and his life. And this is what this, this great uh, text offers to us. It's a book that's been translated into many, many languages. It's been published in Greek about nine times and sold out nine times. And um, uh, it's a classic, <coughs> Orthodox spirituality. It's a classic. It's uh, up there with all, all the contemporary classics, like Father was saying. But I would say, for us in the 21st century, it is essential that we run to the saints, that we run every day to the uh, wellspring of holiness in our century. We can read lives of the saints from other ages, but there is a special word from our Lord when we read the lives of this time and this place, and this is especially true with this biography. Who is Elder Paisios? This is the question that I'm going to introduce to you. I'm going to try to answer, rather, in a very introductory way, of course, very simply. My aim tonight is that you will leave longing to know this man and his life, and you will long to uh, be acquainted with him, not in a superficial way, not in a long-distance way, but that you want to acquire as much as we can in our small way, acquire what he has. And that's why we read the lives of the saints. That's why Elder Paisos read the lives of the saints. He read them to imitate them, to imitate them. And that's our task as well. And so we're not, when we read this, this biography, we're, we're reading the continuation of the Incarnation. We're reading the scripture for today. We're reading the apostles and the prophets who live in our day and age. And there is no difference. When you read Elder Paisios and you see uh, the power of God that came through this man, your mind involuntarily goes to the scriptures. And especially uh, there, are, there are circumstances which remind you of particular passages in the Acts of the Apostles. The power of, of healing, the power of casting out demons, and many, many other great uh, gifts of God to Elder Paisios. A word about the book itself. It's, uh, as Father said, about 720 pages. It's written by his closest disciple, one of his closest disciples, Elder Isaac. Elder Isaac was from Lebanon. He was uh, with the Elder Paisios about 20 years before his repose. And his spiritual son, he reposed in 1998, Elder Isaac. His spiritual son, Elder Ephemios, continued the biography. It was not finished when Elder Isaac reposed. And it was published finally in 2002. Uh, it is uh, written as a book should be written about a saint by holy men who knew him. And so uh, it is very authoritative, very responsible. There are thousands of stories circulating in Greece about Elder Paisios. Everyone has something to say because thousands of people visited him, especially in the last 10 years of his life. And he was instrumental in the founding of four <coughs> monasteries uh, in Greece. Uh, I should say three monasteries in, in Halkidiki, where, where we live, the monastery of St. John the Theologian in Suroti, which is just outside Thessaloniki, which was the place that he reposed at the end of his life in 1994. Uh, the monastery of St. John the Theologian, uh, St. John the Baptist, and the monastery of St. St. Arsenios. And so, besides that, which is a tremendous uh, work, is many, many monks and Manathos had him as a spiritual guide, and, uh, but many, many thousands more came to him when he came out of Manathos, or they came to Manassas to see him, and he literally poured out his soul, his whole life to these people at the end of his life as, a, as, a, as the fruit of his ascetic struggle through many, many years. Now, when you read the ascetic struggle of other places, you just stand in awe of the self-sacrifice, of the self-denial, of the philotimo, the Greek word, which is very hard to translate, which is Basically, I would say, if we can find a scriptural passage which might describe philotimo, it would be when the Lord says, when they ask you to go one mile, go two. When he asks your tunic, you give, you give the uh, overcoat, I don't know how you translate it in English. And you give much more than they ask. You struggle to outdo the other in goodness. You struggle to sacrifice more for them. And you constantly think of their needs. And of course, first and foremost, is the wants and the needs of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so he lived thirsting 
to love, to serve, and to be in communion constantly with our Lord Jesus Christ. And you see that it comes off the pages. It, there's so many vivid stories. I'm going to tell just a few tonight, which to communicate this tremendous, <coughs> amazing, self-sacrificial love of, of, of our Lord. And that is the key, the spiritual key to understanding our own uh, walk, but our, the life of the elder Paisius as well. Elder Paisius was born in 1924 in Asia Minor. And he was um, uh, born into a very pious family. And they were inheritors of 1900 years of, or at least 1800 years of tremendous piety, uh, or I should say devoutness. Uh, this is the fruit of the Cappadocian tradition, the heart of orthodoxy. So many great saints came from Cappadocia. He was born in Farasa of Cappadocia, which is a small village on the frontier of Cappadocia, into a family and into a community which we can probably only, um, uh, in our uh, imagination, <coughs> under, uh, come to, to grasp. I mean, it's really something that's far beyond the Christian community that, that exists in the West. They had, for instance, they had a tremendous self-sacrificial love of the brethren. They had a monastic, we would probably say today, Piety. In other words, they, they had daily services. They fasted until the ninth hour at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, there was no artificial uh, uh, division between monastic and layperson. We read in the life, of, for instance, of Elder Hieronymus of Egina, how, how the layperson, how lay people, laymen, reached great heights of tremendous ascetic life and the grace of God and the experience of God and had many gifts. And so in Cappadocia, this thing that we've inherited in the West, which is a sharp distinction between the monastic life and the lay life, really was not, uh, did not exist in practice. They had tremendous ascetic lives uh, in, in the family and in, in the community. His family had 10 children, and Elder uh, Saint Arsenios the Cappadocian was the one who baptized all 10 children. How many know about Saint Arsenios the Cappadocian? Just a few. St. Arsenios was the parish priest in Farasa. He was uh, the one who baptized Elder Paisios. I'm going to read you the story about that. It's very important to understand uh, and put his life in context. He later was glorified by the church, largely because of Elder Paisios and the, the material that he gathered, that he heard himself growing up from his own mother. And so we have St. Arsenios. There's a book written by Elder Paisios about St. Arsenios that you can buy. It's, in, it's been translated into English quite some time now. When he was baptized, his parents wanted to name him Christos, after his grandfather. But St. Arsenio said to his grandmother, Ah, Haji Anna. Haji is a Turkish word. It means somebody had gone to Jerusalem on pilgrimage, as many of them had from, from Asia Minor. I've baptized so many children for you. Won't you give me one of them, one of them my name? And turning to his parents, he remarked, it's right for you to want to have, leave a boy behind you to follow in his grandfather's footsteps. But don't I want to leave a monk behind to follow in mine? And then he addressed the godmother, telling her, say Arsenios, his own name. And thus he gave the child his own name and his blessing and prophesied that he would become a monk. And the same year, the same, very same year, the exchange, population exchange between Greece and Turkey took place, and so they are uprooted from San Farasa. And St. Arsenios prophesied that they would uh, uh, end up uh, in Greece, and within one year he would repose, as he did, and they ended up in a small village in Konitsa, which is in far northwestern Greece, near Igumenisa, not far from the Albanian border. And that's where Elder Paisius grew up. So he grew up not listening to fairy tales. And I think when, let I me mean just make a little parenthesis here. When we read the lives of the saints, we need to be asking ourselves questions continually. Uh, how should I raise my children? What should I teach my children? What should I read to my children? And then we find the answers in the lives of the saints. And we should imitate them if we want to achieve the same, at least some degree of the same holiness and, and, glo and uh, uh, sanctification that the saints had. So we ask ourselves, what did she read to Elder Paisios? And again, she did not read fairy tales, but she read the life, uh, stories from St. Arsenios and the lives of the saints. And she taught him humility. She taught him not to want to beat the other children at their games and brag about it. Not to try to be the first in line, since being first or last was the same thing. 
She taught him abstinence by instructing him not to eat before it was mealtime. And she considered the violation of this rule akin to fornication because it showed a lack of self-control. So this is a very monastic thought, isn't it? We've looked, this is from the, the St. John the Climacus, that, that eating outside at mealtime is, is lack of self-control, so it's akin to, to a much greater sin, of course, which is fornication. And this was right from his mother's uh, uh, breast, let's say, that he started learning the monastic way of life. She helped him to become simple, diligent, tidy, attentive to his behavior towards others. She taught him never to refer to the name of the tempter. In other words, never name the enemy of our salvation. And that's where we have the word in Greek that he used for the tempter, tangalaki, which is a, from the Bondian dialect, which basically means troublemaker. That's the only way you could probably translate it into English. He never referred to the name. Or he would say, doexopotho. In other words, the person who should be out of here, the, 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 the one who should not be among us. And I think that's instructive, that he took that from his mother, and he used it entire entire life. And, he, and that whole posture he kept. So when he would actually encounter the devil and see him with his own eyes later in his own life, encounter the demons, in, in, in both in temptations, but also when he cast them out of, of people. How many have read the life of the young man, the guru, and, and Elder Paisas, which circulates? Well, you saw in that book, who was it's written by a good friend of ours, who lives in Thessaloniki, Athanasius Rakapodis. It's got a, another name on the book, but everyone knows in Thessaloniki that he wrote this book. And, and in there, he talks about his own experience of having a demon and being, it being cast out by Elder Paisios. So Elder Paisios, when he had confronted the demons, he did not give them, uh, even psychologically, the power that many of us give. We fear. And in fact, when people would talk about the Antichrist, and people, nuns would come to him and he would say, you know, uh, we're, I'm afraid. I'm afraid of the last times of the Antichrist. He would say, why are you afraid? Uh, is, is it going to be worse than the devil? Could the Antichrist be worse than the devil? There should be no fear in the Christian for these things. There should be watchfulness, but no fear. Just like there should be remembrance of death, but not fear of death. And so this he took from his experience. Everything he taught about the, the, the thoughts, so much of what he taught, if you've read his life, his teachings, I should say, you know that he stressed how important the thoughts were in the spiritual life. And how we need to encounter the temptation in the thought before it becomes an action. And how we need to fight with good thoughts, our, our thoughts of depression or our evil thoughts. That didn't come from a book. That came from his life. And you'll see later on, I'll read you a story about how uh, that came directly from a tremendous set, uh, temptation that he himself had. And how he encountered it. And he learned from the Lord himself how to encounter temptations. So right from the beginning, he had an experience of the grace of God and the spiritual warfare. And that's something that in and of itself should be a tremendous teaching for us. Because many of us remain on the horizontal line of being an Orthodox Christian. We obtain the Orthodox faith, we're grateful, we, we, we've spent much of our life seeking, and now we've found it and we're grateful. And we think that's enough. That's only the beginning if we're going to be truly orthodox in word and deed, if we're going to have the way and not just the truth of orthodoxy. And that way is the orthodox ethos. That's how we are, how we be, how we carry ourselves. And we can learn a tremendous amount about that from this book and from this life because he walked and from experience lived the person of Christ. He was a communion with the person of Christ who is the way, the truth, and the life. When he was a young man, <laughs> Uh, Arsenios uh, fasted with great zeal. He fasted strictly from a very young age. He would ask his mother to boil greens without oil for him to eat. In order to continue fasting after the divine liturgy, he would wait to eat andidron, so there would be no temptation to eat, because we know that you cannot eat andidron if you're not fasting. So he would purposely trick himself, let's say, so he could fast longer after the divine liturgy. He would tighten his belt, and he would fast so much that oftentimes he would fall on his bed from exhaustion as a young boy. <clears throat> when he learned to read, the first thing he would read was, of course, the Holy Scriptures, the four Gospels. When he'd come home from school, he'd run to the lives of the saints, and he would devour them. And his brother would be jealous and try to hide them from him. And, of course, that only made him even want to more, more and more to read the lives of the saints. He would run out to the forest or to the mountains or to the chapels outside of his village and he would read there secretly. He would do the services, the paraclesi. He would gather young children together in order to, to do the, the service of supplication of the mother of God. 
he was continually looking for an experience of the grace of God and not simply being content with being orthodox in, were, in, uh, in terms of the confession of faith. So he understood in practice that there are two kinds of faith in the church. There's the faith that we confess, and that is absolutely essential if we're going to be members of the church and we're going to have the grace of God because the spirit of truth does not dwell where there is not a confession of the orthodox faith. However, that is only the beginning. That's the foundation, as it were. Faith is truly, in its core, trust. And trust is not obtained without experience. Trust is not obtained without a personal experience. We don't trust people we don't know. And so if we don't trust Christ, we have still much to know about Christ. We are still on the path to knowing Him. And so the, the elder Paisios obtained trust of the Lord. And then we must obtain trust of the Lord experientially. So he put into practice everything he read, or almost everything he read. And you'll hear a story in a little while how sometimes he did it somewhat undiscerningly as a young man. But we can see that even in that, the Lord blessed him. Let me read you a story at age 15, which is very characteristic of his great philotimo, his great self-sacrificial, heroic love of Christ. From the age of 11, the elder says about himself, I read the lives of the saints, fasted, kept vigil. My older brother would take the books and hide them. But that didn't stop me. I would just go into the forest and keep reading there. Later, when Arsenios was 15, a friend of his brother's named Costas told his brother, I'll make him willingly give up all that stuff. So they were jealous of him because they didn't have that kind of experience and love of Christ. So they wanted to make him stop so they didn't have to worry about it themselves. As the elder related, he came and explained to me Darwin's theory of evolution. I was shaken by this. I said, I'll go and pray, and if Christ is God, he'll appear to me so that I'll believe. A shadow, a voice, something, something. He'll show me something. That's all I can come up with, the elder says. So I went and began to pray, make prostrations, which I did for hours, but nothing happened. Finally, I stopped in a state of exhaustion, and then something Costa said to me came to my mind. I can accept that Christ is an important man, righteous and virtuous, who is hated out of envy for his virtue and condemned by his brethren, his countrymen. And then I said to myself, even if that's how Christ was, even if he was only a man, he deserves my love, my obedience, my self-sacrifice. I don't want paradise, I don't want anything it's worth making every sacrifice for the sake of His holiness and His kindness. And that's all God wanted. He was waiting, the elder says. God was waiting to see what kind of response I would have. And he spent <laughs> hours doing prostrations, hours praying. But the Lord was waiting for what kind of encounter, what kind of response to the temptation He would have in His thoughts. Would He have an heroic response? And that's when the Lord appeared to him in a great light. And he had the gospel book in his hand, and he said to him, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe, he who believes in me is not dead, yet he, even if he were dead, he shall, he, he shall live. And so he was open, he had open, in his open hands the gospel with the same words. And so even at 15 years of age, because of his tremendous self-sacrifice, but also because of his philotima, his great sacrificial, heroic love of the person of Christ, the Lord visited him, showed himself to him, and, and uh, changed his, his whole approach, his whole understanding uh, of, of the Christian life because of that, that vision, that with the root of the temptation, and they're not take, making amends, and therefore the grace of God is not coming back to heal them. Well, let me read a little bit, because we don't have much time, and I don't want to go over it, and I want to open it up to questions and answers. Let me read a few excerpts from the section entitled, The Gifts of God to the Elder Paisos, which are tremendous. And I want to do that because I want you to understand the heights that this man reached, and understand that they are directly related to his ascetic struggle, his crucifixion of the flesh and of the mind, and only in, in that way, when we send the cross, are we going to received the grace of God as he did. Now he was uh, just great, as Father said, he was uh, given such grace, so many gifts, 
uh, by God. And I'm not, not going to read them all because there are many. There are actually 17 or 19 small sections on different gifts of God uh, to the elder. I'm just going to mention a few, and then we'll get into a few stories. Many times he would walk, it would be raining, but he would not get wet. Many times they would take photographs of him without a blessing, and he would not appear in the photographs. Many times he would immediately appear before the pilgrims without them seeing how he came to them. Other times they saw him in midair, in prayer. Other times, uh, well, I'll read this section. This is very interesting. I'll read this one to you. Very short. One time when he was at Stomio, two bears came into the yard of the monastery at Stomio. The elder grabbed them by the scruff of the neck and told them, next time don't come into the monastery like that. Come around the back of the kitchen so I can feed you. Yeah. And then he took them there. So he had, there are many stories of his relation to the animals, as Father said. He had snakes, he had birds, he had all kinds of animals that came to him. And people saw him asking to leave the, the monastery grounds or feeding them or any, any number of things. He had, a, he had the thing that, that we saw in the life of St. Seraphim Serov. He was uh, like Adam in the garden, as we see in the lives of other saints. He said earlier that he was someone who had encounters with the demons. And he was a scourge of the demons. I'll read you just one, one uh, excerpt from that, or two excerpts from that. One night when the elder was at Stomio, he said to a young man who was staying at the monastery, you stay here, I'm going up somewhere else. And he set off for a cave. To get to it, he had to climb down a steep slope of 300 yards. When he was climbing, he heard a rooster crow in the desert. He understood who it really was, and didn't proceed further, remaining there all night in prayer. This was the first time the devil bothered him at Stobio. For some time at the beginning of the elder's stay at the Iviranski, the devil would come and knock on the door of his cell, saying, to the prayers of our holy fathers. The elder would reply to him, you're driving me to paradise, devil. You get me up to pray. There was a temptation in that cell, because a layman who was involved a bit with spells poured holy water from the great blessing of the waters out of the walls, in a scornful way. These are just two small excerpts from his encounters with the demons. Now this is a, a, a story about he, how he cast out demons from possessed people that came to him. They brought a possessed girl to Soroti for me to see, reported the elder. The poor thing was really exhausted and she showed me a tumor on her right side as hard as a rock. I took out a shell that I had hanging around my neck which had one of St. Arsenio's molars in it, a relic of the saint. And I pressed it on the tumor. She started shouting, and her cries caused a stir all over the monastery. She was trying to vomit, and then I put a holy relic around her neck, and she began moving her head very quickly, back and forth, as if it was going to fall off her neck. In the end, the demon left her. And worn out as she was, she calmed down and was healed. And of course, he doesn't say it, but she was healed by his prayers. This is from the section, As Myrrh Gushing Forth. This is that the Lord, the Lord gave for the elder uh, the gift of letting off a tremendous, wonderful aroma as myrrh. And this is attested to by many people. Another Athenite monk relates, the fragrance that sprang from the elder was something else. Many times when I kissed his hand, I would smell a supernatural aroma like myrrh. I would smell the same thing coming from his mouth when he spoke, even though because of his extreme fasting, the smell should have been a foul one. Time after time, the first thing I would notice when I would pass by the creek on the way to his cell was this aroma, which would accompany me the whole way to his cell at Panaguda. This is the last cell that he had at Manathos. He would be able to communicate with foreigners. There's several stories how he talked with people who were French speakers or English speakers. He himself did not know any foreign languages. I'll read you just one story. One day relates to the spiritual child of the elder. I went to Panaguda very early in the morning. The light had just begun to shine. I rang the little bell and the elder opened up for me smiling. He asked me, what do you say, Papa? When St. Ephraim the Syrian visited St. Basil the Great, did they need an interpreter? I don't think so, Yeroda, I told him. 
I entered the guest house and found a foreign visitor there. While the elder was getting ready to treat us to something, I started talking with the guests, using the little English that I knew. And he told me that he had arrived very late in the previous night, having lost his way. Time passed by, and the elder put him up for the night. The elder had left him for about 10 minutes in the beginning because they couldn't communicate. But he left them to go and pray. And when he returned, they could talk without any difficulty. The elder knew Greek, the visitor English, but they had no problem in conversing. It was also well known that the elder could be, or by the grace of God, present in other places. And there was one story here where he was in Jerusalem. Everybody knew he had left for Jerusalem and was on pilgrimage. There were, a gift, there, were, there were a group of people who went to visit him. And they sat and they spoke with him and talked for quite a long time. And then they left and went to the monastery of Philotheo and told the fathers there, we saw Yero de Paisos, we had a wonderful talk. And the father said, well, that's impossible because he's in Jerusalem. And then they went the next day and found that, in fact, he was in Jerusalem. They talked to other monks in the area. No, he's in Jerusalem. And that story circulated throughout the Holy Mountain. Even in his own lifetime, it was well known. He could sense the prayers and entreaties of people far away. And he talks about that himself. He says himself, we went to see, somewhat relates this rather, we went to see the elder before the other fathers came for the feast. The elder was by himself in the guest house. When we saw him, he told me, just now a woman appeared to me. I was asking for help. She seemed to be very sick. Her face was thin and yellow like a lemon. She was in a lot of pain. Many times people appear before me and ask for help. He knew about the state of the reposed. By the grace of God, the elder, having a pure intellect, was deemed worthy to see the souls of people at the time that they were, they were leaving the earth and ascending towards heaven. He also knew the state of some of those who had fallen asleep. When asked, he would answer about the soul of a departed person according to the state he was sought in. For example, he might say, God has granted rest to your mother's soul, or you should do alms in his name, or let us pray to the Lord so he will grant him rest. The elder one said, I wanted to know about the first nun who had reposed in the monastery of Suroti, what state her soul was in. They brought her to me in their arms. They, is presumably, are the angels. They brought her to me in their arms. The elder demonstrated it as though he were carrying a baby. And they told me, the soul of Magdalene, this is the soul of Magdalene. She was in a very good spiritual state, as high a state as an ascetic I knew who practiced asceticism for many years. The most well-known gift to the elder by, all, by, by far is his clairvoyance and his foresight. I'm going to read you two excerpts from this section. There are many, many pages with many stories. And there are books, local, many books that circulate about this and other gifts uh, of the elder that are not in this, in this life. Because he had the gifts of clairvoyance and foresight, at times the elder knew by the grace of God about the coming of visitors, their attitude, their spiritual state, their name, where they were from, their line of work, their past, and their future. He had a spiritual television, as it were. And at times he could see people who were far away. He would know what they were doing, how they were, what they were going through. Other times he knew he, what it was in a letter that was brought to him without opening it. Or he would know what a package contained and he would respond without having to open it. When the war started in the Persian Gulf, he relates <coughs> himself, I felt pain while I was sleeping. I heard the thundering of the artillery, the bombs and the planes, and I woke up. I realized the war had started, that something very bad had happened. Afterwards, the fathers came to me from Kuldemusio Monastery, and they told me the war had indeed begun, and I responded that it had started about two hours ago. I felt the same thing on the third day of the war. A middle-aged man came here, recalls the elder, who suffered with a bad headache for about a year, and the doctors couldn't help him. I saw him coming from ways off, and right away I realized that he had a demon. He told me about his suffering, so I told him, these things are happening to you because you cheated on a woman. And she went off and had a spell, a demonic, uh, she called on the demons to come and give you these troubles. Plus, you shamed another young girl. You need to go to ask forgiveness of them. Go to confession, have them read exorcisms over you, and you'll be fine. 
He also had the gift of healing. He saw many saints. I'm cutting this short because I want to open it up for questions and answers. He saw the mother of God. He saw the Christ himself, not once, but many times. He saw St. Catherine, St. Ephemia, the great martyr, who talked to him about his own martyr, her own martyrdom, but also apparently counseled him about the whole question of the non-Chalcedonians. Because she is the great martyr, as you know, her relics were instrumental in the Fourth Ecumenical Council. And he had a particularly strident stance on that issue, most likely because of his uh, uh, encounter with St. Ephemia, but also for other reasons. So uh, he also, and this is probably theologically speaking at least, the most sure sign of his deification, that he had passed purification, he had been illumined, he had reached the oceans, he had reached glorification. He saw and was seen in the uncreated light. And I'll read just one excerpt from that. This is a higher monk, his name is Stephen from Lakoskiti, someone that I had the blessing of meeting and knowing among Athos. Uh, and he's the translator of this text into Romanian, and he relates the following. It was the second time I had visited the elder in the fall of 1993. Father Dositheus, the Romanian, was with me. We went through the back door, and we found a lot of people in the yard. The elder was standing up, speaking with someone, and he had his back to us. When he heard our footsteps, he turned around and looked at us, and what did I see before me? His face was shining. It was visible, but in a light. I stopped before this unusual sight, and my heart was filled with much love and great joy. The elder looked very sweet. He, I never felt such love before. And then his face became normal once again. Another Athenite recounts, at the neighboring hermitage of St. John the Theologian, a monastic tonsure was taking place. Elder Pais was present, and I was standing next to him. At the time of the communion hymn, which he chanted, I looked over, and I saw his head. His head was shining like a light bulb. I couldn't look at him. This lasted for a short time. There are many other things one could relate about the Elder Paisios. His teaching on philotono, spiritual sacrifice, nobility. His teaching on the thoughts. His teaching on humility, obedience, how important it is. His teaching on the church, something that's very important for us in the Western world. Because although we understand it theologically or rationally or theoretically, we don't understand it oftentimes in practice. And so the elder helps us very much in understanding what it means to be a member of the body of Christ, what it means to, to live and to sacrifice for the confession of the Orthodox faith. He speaks about the old calendars and the schism that was created in 1924, 1923. He speaks about Roman Catholicism, Monophysitism, or non-Chalcedonians. He had a great encounter with evangelical Protestants in Stomio, near Stomio in the, in, the, in the village, and he worked very hard to drive out the missionary activity in their village. So he is someone we can run to uh, for answers on how to be patriotic. What does it mean to be patriotic? He shows us in practice how patriotic he was and what the difference is between patriotism and ethnicism, something that we could use in, this, in the Western world. Um, he had an encounter with the Eastern religions. There's stories in here of his encounter with a Buddhist who came and tried to uh, uh, challenge him to spiritual struggles and how that, was, that man was eventually converted to the faith through the elder Paisios. He talks about how, how wrong it is to think that all the religions are the same. How many of us follow that trap today? And we think of uh, many paths up the mountain or the transcendental unity of religions as this philosophy of perennialism and other things that people buy into. The elder shows us in practice and in word why Hinduism or Buddhism or other religions are not the same, are not an experience of the one God. And so many, many things. And we need these teachings especially for our own days. So this is an essential book in every Christian, Orthodox Christian's library uh, because it is so close to us and so important for us. So with that, I'll close. I thank you for the opportunity to present a very, very quick introduction of this tremendous book. But I hope that you all have questions, and I hope that each of your concerns we can at least address uh, and, and, and get into some of your own concerns tonight. Thank you very much. So if anyone has a question, just raise your hand, and we'll, uh, Father will take them. Yes. Uh, did the elder ever become a priest? 
The elder said that that was offered to him, and he didn't mean by, by a bishop. He understood that the Lord would accept it if he wanted to become a priest. He denied that. He didn't want that. He, and so in response to somebody, he said, we don't need to receive all the gifts that the Father gives. Some of them we can, we can deny. He didn't want to become a priest. He didn't want to. He liked to be a monk. He remained that way. I mean, I, let me say it also before I forget. Tremendous part and important part for Orthodox Christians in America in the, in the book is his chapter on the difference between devoutness and piety. And he made a distinction. In other words, devoutness is evlavia in Greek, and piety is evsevia. He never used the word evsevia. He were, used the word evlavia, and he made a sharp distinction between the two. I think the one would be an external showing of devotion, or the other would be a true devotion, an internal devotion. And he describes many of that, how important that is, and how important it is as a criteria to understanding and being an Orthodox Christian, and how the, those who devout uh, are, are those who really are going to make progress in the spiritual life. And that's in a tremendous section that I, I highly recommend and I, I'd love to get into if we had more time, but um, it is uh, uh, really important for us who want to obtain not just an orthodox confession, but an orthodox ethos, an orthodox way of life. Without devoutness, without humility, it's impossible. Because we come with our own baggage, we come with our own ideas of what orthodox is all about, and, and we don't want to adopt those things because of our pride, and we don't understand how important it is, at least in the beginning, even if it doesn't seem natural to adopt certain practices in order to become comfortable and to, and to change our habits and our, our ways of life and to obtain an orthodox ethos. Only when we do that can we make progress in the spiritual life. Humility, devoutness, and the orthodox, that, that goes in to, to make up the orthodox way of being. So that's an important, important teaching of the elder. Any other questions? All of that, there's no questions. I can't believe it. I think there must be questions. Go ahead. You mentioned that monks, they comprehend everything about our faith, they study, they need knowledge, all for the glory of God, of course. But my question is, why then they isolate themselves and stay there rather than come out and help us? The other Paisios made a, uh, uh, in the early part of his spiritual life, he made a great struggle to leave the world. And it's essential that, they leave, that the monk leaves the world. He cut off relations with his father and mother. When he went back to his village, he refused to go and sleep at his mother's house. Uh, and he loved his mother dearly. And he owed so much to his mother. But it was essential for his spiritual life that he make the whole of society, the whole world, his brothers and sisters. And that, that he not uh, remain within that small enclosure. And over time, uh, he sought isolation. He went to Mount Sinai for three years. And in that isolation, that being alone with God, is when he obtained, uh, through great asceticism, much grace. And God showered him with grace. And he was able to then become even closer to God, become a glorified, uh, deified man. And, and then... When God showed him that it was time, he could turn to the world and then truly offer back to the world uh, those treasures. If he had not done that, he would not be able to praise If he had not done that, he would not be able to offer back to the world the great things that God gave to him. But there are many monks who never will come out because they've never reached the heights. And so coming out would be destructive for their spiritual life. Not, it would neither help you or, and me who are in the world or themselves. So it, it, a monk must leave, and a Christian in many ways, must leave the world behind. Now, we can't leave uh, the worldly things uh, in terms of you know, paying bills or you know, going to hospitals or whatever it might be, going to schools. But we must struggle to leave the worldly things behind. We must struggle to leave the worldly ways behind. Otherwise, we will not make progress. So it is not at all a denial of the world. It's, it's, it's a love of the world. He speaks at length about that about how important it is that the monks pray for the world, that they can truly help the world when they pray for the world. That's when they offer, and that's the thing we need them to do. We need them to be praying for us. We don't need them to be next to us uh, and, and, and teach us. That's why we have priests. That's why we have catechists. That's how the church has always worked. And without monasticism, uh, the church is just lost. It's absolutely lost in the world. And, and it, it, it's, it's proven 
through 2,000 years of history that the, mon the monastic life is the, uh, is the center of the church. It's what keeps the church uh, on the straight and narrow, and the grace of God comes through the monastic uh, uh, life. So I don't know if I answered your question, but uh, you will find the answer in this biography. You're, you're chuckling, so I don't think you like my answer. Yeah. We can talk about it afterwards if you didn't. Go ahead. Uh, Father, um, by living in the world, you, you keep saying that uh, Father Paisios found uh, uh, God's will in his life. Uh, how difficult or easy is it for us Orthodox Christians to find uh, uh, God's will for us in this life? And, and, and how do we know that that we are on that path? Well, the elder sought to be obedient. And when we're obedient to the church, we're obedient to the spiritual fathers, even if they're not as holy as we would like them to be or think they should be, even if they're not as smart, even if they're not as educated, it's the obedience that we give to them that's going to open up uh, the heavens and it's going to be uh, our guidance. And even if they make a mistake, the Lord will correct it. The Lord, and that's what the elder taught. I'm not, I'm not telling you my own ideas. This is what the elder Christ was taught. So when we humble ourselves, then the will of God opens up before us. We have to trust the Lord. We also have to run to those who have spiritual experience. One of the biggest problems in the Western world is that we have very few that have the kind of spiritual experience that, that, that makes them an elder. And so we have a more difficult path in America. But there are those who do that. Now, there's a difference between eldership, spiritual fatherhood, and confessor. Those are three different kind of things, right? You can be a spiritual father, uh, and you'll be a confessor. You can be a confessor and not a spiritual father. You can be a spiritual father and not an elder. The role of eldership is very particular in, in the Orthodox Church. And so many people say, well, I can't have an elder that's you know, on the other side of America or on Mount Athos. Well, what we're, not, we're not really looking for an elder. We're looking for a spiritual father. That's different. And if you look in the life of Elder Ambrose, the same thing with Elder Paisios, or even Elder Femme in America, the same role they pay, play. People didn't run to Elder Ambrose in Russia every day for every need. They weren't looking for that. They went to him with particular concerns and needs, and they walked away with the answer from God. So it is essential that the church maintain eldership, but not to turn the elder into our spiritual father or confessor. Those are three different roles. And we confuse those in America, I think. And the parish, parish priest wants to be all many times, or, or he wants to play the role of the elder, but it's, it's, it's a particular grace and charism in the church. Uh, elder Price had that grace. He was given, but even if he wasn't a, he wasn't a higher monk, but he had that grace. So your, your question is, how do we know the will of God? We know the will of God when we're obedient and we're humble. And that's the only way we're going to move God. So if we don't know it experientially, like Elder Paisius did, because it reached his heights, and he saw and understood, because he had <coughs> purified his intellect, and he understood what God wanted from him, we're going to know it by being obedient to our spiritual fathers, our confessors, if we don't have a spiritual father, or our elders. And that's how we're going to know it in the church. And the humility is going to open the door to that, not necessarily the intellectual knowledge or even the spiritual advancement of, uh, of, the, of the priest. It's the humility of the confessor, the, the confessee, I should say, that opens up uh, the will of God to us. I have a, a couple of questions. The first kind of piggybacks on the... Elder Paisus is billions, you know, because he... What, what is that zero? It's our ascetic effort. It's our struggle. So don't look at the result. Don't look at what others did. Just start today and love Christ with all your heart, soul, and mind and struggle to be in your place, in your time, imitators of the saints and imitators of Christ, and forget all the rest. Elder Paisius never thought he was a saint. He never wanted anybody to think he was a saint. He says toward the end of his life, I've made the biggest mistake. People think I'm a saint. You know, this is awful. They're not, they're not going to pray for me when I die. So, you know, don't think that the saints, don't think that the saints go around and say, you know, I've arrived, or the monks even say that. They're focused right there on getting to know their own sins and loving Christ, just like you and I. And there are many monks who don't make any progress in the spiritual life. There's no guarantee. You don't, you don't get in a monastery. There you go. They go flying off spiritually. <laughs> there are many monks who don't make any progress because they're doing the same thing you and I are doing or a lot of us are doing. I'm not speaking for you, of course. I don't know. But, you know, we're not, we're not loving the Lord with all our heart. We're, we're, we're remaining 
uh, in the externals, or we're just lazy, or we love you know the passions, we love to caress the passions. Let's let's face reality. We don't hate sin. The elder hated sin. That story I read about him cutting into his leg with a hatchet. What is that? He hated sin. He didn't want one second to be separated from the love of God. He didn't want for one second to not to feel anything but the grace of God. Do we do that? No. We are okay with it. We want to eat more. We want to sleep more. And we're, we like it. And that's why we don't make progress in the spiritual life. So it's very clear that just struggle, struggle, struggle. And love Christ with all your heart. And don't worry about all the rest. It doesn't matter. Go ahead. What is postcards from Greece? Postcards from Greece is the podcast that I rarely do, unfortunately. A lot of people get angry at me. But uh, I have an a ancient faith radio podcast. Uh, Podcast that people asked me to do a couple years ago, and I started doing it, and I occasionally get to it. But uh, so I talk about things like that. But the life of Elder Joseph the Hesychus, for instance, I give you an example, uh, is out in Greek. I read from it. I talked about it. How important it is uh, in Greece, and so it's not in English yet. So you get a little glimpse of what that's that book's about. I talk about the citizen card, things in Greece that are going on. You know, different issues about the village I'm in, the the tradition in the village. So. It's, on, it's at ancientfaith.com. You can go and check it out. Might be something's interesting there. Yes? Could you discuss how the, uh, the Greco Turkish conflict uh, influenced and framed the elder's life? The Greco Turkish conflict, how it influenced the elder's life? Uh, I don't think that it directly influenced his life, but he certainly responded to it. I mean, he was, he was a patriot, so that was a part of his whole education, his past. He was from Asia Minor. He had a great love for his homeland. Uh, he uh, also was a part of an Athenite tradition which had a tradition of prophecy about that and how that's going to end up. And he himself had prophecies about that. He speaks about that in his, in his own time and people quote him. Now, there's a little bit of confusion on exactly what he said and what's attributed to him. In this book, they've made a, you know, they've been very conservative and they've been very they, they only put in what they absolutely know is contributed to the elder, and they, they accept that. But he did uh, speak about, uh, now this is, this is not something you can get into very quickly, so please don't run away and say, well, the elder priest said that, because you need to get into the whole uh, context. But he spoke about the, fut the near future, about uh, uh, that eventually uh, there will be a war, it will be a world war, uh, it will come after a time of tremendous trial for the Greek people. He talked about there'll be in the future tremendous taxes levied against the Greek people, and that'll be an excuse for them to introduce, because of tax evasion, it'll be an excuse for them to introduce more and more totalitarian means to control the population. But they won't, they won't uh, succeed, because there'll be a war that'll break out. So a lot of people, I mean, you know, Elder Price is interesting. He's one of the, I think even in terms of Elder Prophetus and others, he has, he's a national figure in Greece. I mean, we watch him on TV, we have documentaries, they have shows about him. Uh, everybody knows about Elder Prophetus. Even if you have no relation to the church, you know about Elder Prophetus. And there are people who really manipulate his memory to make money. And there are people who circulate books because they know everybody knows about him, everybody loves him. And uh, so people talk about these prophecies. And so it's not very healthy, of course, because they're, they're people who don't have any spiritual life at all. And so they, they just take that and they, uh, they, don't, they don't understand the context from which it came. But certainly, uh, he's a hero of the, of the Greek people today. And they look to him uh, and his, his words about the, the immediate future or the near future. I don't know. It's really hard to say when it all come to pass as true and as a, as a godly man that uh, spoke about the the future of the church. So he does, he does talk about that he, uh, Constantinople will be taken back, uh, that it'll be in the hands of the Greeks, not because the Greeks deserve it, but because it'll be given to them. They won't even give it the war. So uh, anyway, there's a lot there, but I'm not going to get into that. It's a huge issue. Why don't and we take one more question from Sophia? One more question. That was quick. Didn't you have one already? Yeah. No, she hasn't asked. No, that was you. Oh, yeah. okay. Sure. How, how is the spiritual life in Greece? How are the people in Greece today? Well, I mean, there's, uh, there's, two, there's two reactions to this whole crisis, isn't there? There's the reaction of the, of, I would say, the average Greek who is not very churched, and that is that uh, they're angry, 
uh, they're, they're distraught, and some of them are very distraught because of very difficult times for Greek people today. And they respond in a worldly manner. They see it in worldly context, and they're, they're reacting that way. Uh, and, uh, but there are those in the church who see this as an opportunity for repentance, for a national repentance, for people to come back to the church. Uh, and, uh, and they realize this is, this is at least partly a response that we're responsible for it ourselves as the people of Greece because of our uh, distance from the church. I mean, on a typical Sunday in Greece, it's probably 5% of the population in church. So it's, we're not talking about the Greece of my village 50 years ago, which everybody was in church on Sunday. Out of my village, which is a very tiny village, we probably have about half of the people in church. That's pretty good in Greece today. Uh, so that, so there are you know, different interpretations, different, different fruit from those for the, each person. But uh, uh, I think that ultimately, uh, th there's a separating of the sheep from the goats, but there's also a sobering effect. People are being sober. They're not, they're, they're realizing that it's not all, you know, it's, it's, it's a mirage. What we have and what we think we will have and this, and this European Union and all the stuff that's been promised and lavished on the Greek people, it's a mirage, it's a sham, and so that's good. That they, they, they lose trust in this world and they have to turn. Now, will they turn back to God? Will they turn to the church? There's been a lot of effort on the part of people who hate the church to, to throw mud at it and make it look like it's a non, uh, it's not a uh, solution. And so in the media, you see all the time negative things about the church. And so how many people are going to overcome that and embrace the church? Only God knows. Thank you, Father.